2014 team of the season. Dr. Conley. I'd like to introduce our athletic director, Dr. Lois Bissell. Um, she thinks very hard when she uh, mentions a team for a team of the season and um, I think does it for all the right reasons. And so we're very, very proud of the team that has come before us this evening. And Dr. Bissell, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have the boys football team come up with me? These are obviously just some of our players. Some of our players are, have basketball practice tonight, hockey practice, things like that. But um, we have a fairly good group here for you tonight, and a, a, certainly a very representative group of some of our hardest working players. Uh, we had a new coaching staff this year. It was led by head coach A.J. Taddeo. Um, we had three uh, paid assistant coaches. Uh, one of them is here tonight, uh, Dennis Camp. And we were very fortunate to have uh, four uh, volunteer coaches as well that did an outstanding job. Trevor Williams over there, uh, Tim Wilson, and James Hickman. And so we're very grateful to all of them. And right from the start, they came in and immediately placed um, a, a much higher demands on, on our players in terms of their time, in terms of academic standards, behavioral standards, and their character. And truthfully, we lost some players along the way um, because of that, and we had some people complain that we were being too hard and too demanding, but we knew that was the price we were going to have to pay to uh, turn this program around and to instill a greater commitment and character in our team. So we started uh, the season undermanned in terms of numbers, and then it just got worse from there because we had injury after injury after injury. In the very first series of the very first um, game against D.O. Smith, our starting quarterback broke his collarbone and he was out for the season and it just kind of went from there. Um, some of our top, top players, Matt Miller, Zach Graves, um, ended up having season ending injuries so it made it tough for us. Um, on top of that, our line was uh, terribly undersized, I would say, for Elijah was going up against kids that were probably outweighed him by 50 to 100 pounds, three to four inches taller. Um, we played a lot of sophomores and even some freshmen on the varsity, which is kind of unheard of, but uh, we needed to call those kids into duty as well just because of our numbers and, and kind of where we were with injuries. And, and yet, um, you know, through all of that, we fought. Um, from the very first game when we played E.O. Smith, they were shocked that we were in the game only down one touchdown going deep into the fourth quarter. We took Platt to three overtimes before losing. Um, what? Plain oh, playing goal. Sorry, three three overtimes before playing. Yeah, play, that's very good. Um, three uh, overtimes before we lost to them. Uh, we broke an 18-game losing streak by beating Weaver. Um, so we had certainly some moments um, where we played just uh, really, really hard and really, really well in some games and really hang in there, hung in there till the very, very end. Um, but we make no excuses. Um, none of us are happy with the record that we had this year. We were one and nine. Um, none of us think that's good enough. It's not acceptable to me. It's not acceptable to co the coach. It's, I know it's not acceptable to these guys. But um, we had to start somewhere. And, and certainly, um, you know, again, we make no ex excuses for where we were. These boys never hung their heads. Um, they never complained. They always played hard, clean football. Standing on the sidelines, you could see the difference in their attitudes, effort, and character. It was really unmistakable. Boys who had never made the commitment, um, who had never behaved well enough, who had never gotten the grades good enough um, to play, played this year for these coaches. And they, and they lasted on the team the entire year. And regardless of the score, these boys played as hard on the last down of the game as they did on the first down of the game. Um, other coaches and officials uh, recognized this. It wasn't just me noting this, so much so that the 
Central Connecticut Association of Football Officials awarded this team their 2015 Sportsmanship Award, which was presented to Coach Taddeo and his captains, uh, seniors Matt Mil uh, Miller and Devin Gelnight, uh, junior Zachary Graves and Vito Marciano at uh, dinner at the AquaTurf Club last week. Hard work, accountability, intelligence, character. The culture change will take time, but the foundation has been set, and we are extremely proud of this group of boys. Zachary is holding the trophy that uh, they got for their sportsmanship award. I'm going to read all your names to them, even though a lot of the kids aren't here, just so you can hear who our, our guys were, and then if it's okay, I'll maybe the ones yep. that are here. Yep. Jose Perez, Matthew Miller, <coughs> Devin Gilnight, Elijah King, Cody Morgan, Deande Perez, Devin Berry, Joey Maddox, Danny Capchunos, Zachary Graves, Jacob Mullins, Jake Wilson, Tommy Rolowski, Chris Wheeler, I can't call him Cameron, we know him by Vito Marciano. <laughs> And then uh, Josh Foster, Jacob Krupa, uh, Mark Henry, Zachary Banning, Vinny Torres, Tyler Allen, Kenny Zeng, Malik Tate, Arshdeep Singe, Austin Devine, Jeremy Bedoya, Ryan Main. Camden Eilerman, Jacob Ruggiero, Julius Priester, Robert Tierney, Troy Zedanis, Jonathan St. Germain, Justin Orlowski, Kevin Smith, William Haley, Zachary Woods, Jonathan Gomez, Benjamin Kuka, Zachary Sargent, Alex Loomis and Romeo Soa. Oh, yeah. All right, we got him. Okay, Grand Torres. So again, a lot of these boys aren't here tonight. Uh, I know they had other things. A number of them play on our basketball team. They have practice tonight, but I did want you to uh, to read all their names to you just to to let you know who who was on the team. Oh, and the coaches. Uh, tremendous job as our first year head coach, AJ Taddeo. Uh, Chris Curry is one of our assistants, uh, Dennis Camp, who also works at Loveland Hill School, so we see him a lot, which is great. Did a terrific job for us this year. Ronnie McCune, oh, I'm supposed to be handing it to you, sorry. <laughs> Trevor Williams. <laughs> these guys are so committed, and again, these were our volunteer coaches, James Hickman, Jeff Berry, who's not here, and Tim Wilson. So again, I, I can't tell you how hard it was for them to do what they did and to keep fighting the whole year despite, I mean, how many, I don't know how many guys were even suiting at the end. It was a small number because of all the, the injuries and, and things that happened. But uh, again, if you could see uh, just the fight in these guys, um, again, from the first down to the very last down of the game, um, never took their helmets off on the sideline, uh, never threw any cheap shots at the other guys. Um, we often would be in the games and other teams would be getting unsportsmanlike conduct uh, penalties, but we were not. And we had a lot we could have been sour about because we were getting uh, beat most games, but uh, these guys never did any of that. And it was uh, a testament to their coaches and who they are as young men. So the, the boys football team.
congratulations to all of you and thank you for all your hard work. And um, we wish all of you happy holidays because I'm sure you're all going to be coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but 
But other than that, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for him? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, okay, we'll move on to item 4.0, Community Forum. Opportunity for comments on agenda items, potential future agenda items, and general information provided to the board from citizens and community organizations. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board this evening? Okay. And we'll move on to item 5.0. General business, 5.1, Technology Committee Report. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. The technology, uh, the board's technology committee met earlier this evening, so I'm sure they have some input on this uh, agenda item to review the five-year technology replacement plan uh, for the Vernon Public Schools developed by Mr. Robert Segan, who is the technology director or IT director for the town of Vernon, and uh, the town of Vernon takes care of data processing for the entire town, including the school system. Um, Mr. Segan pulled uh, together using our WASP uh, inventory system and uh, went over that. Um, it's not perfect, the WASP inventory system, but it did give us a lot of information about what we had. His staff then went to each school uh, for an eye, uh, eyes, eyes on uh, to double check the information. And so the information you have, um, as he has put in his executive summary, it, it could be up to 15% off. Um, which is upwards of 300 computers off and on, um, but it is um, it's as, as near as we can get at this point with, with over 200, uh, 2,000 computers in the, in the school system. So um, some of the, the computers are waiting to be disposed of and they are still on our inventory, and then there's a smaller percentage of computers that um, sometimes teachers bring in a computer, so if they have a desktop and they need a laptop, they might bring in their own, and so that might have been an eyes-on computer and not be entered into our uh, computer system. So um, those are the, uh, the error for margin. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Segan if he'd come up to the table then uh, to, to be able to answer any questions you might have. But if you turn, I uh, had an executive summary, and um, he certainly can answer any questions about that. The, the real plan is a one-pager. It's the page right after that. And as you see, the three uh, pie charts on the top show the um, age of the computers that we have right now. So um, one section is desktops and laptops. Another is Chromebooks and iPads. And then the third is our computer lab equipment, because we certainly don't want to forget that. Uh, on the left-hand side, the three grids or spreadsheets going down, that shows the exact numbers and the type of laptop. So a teacher desktop, faculty desktop. Faculty would be um, staff uh, who are not teaching. Um, it could be a secretary, it could be a, um, it could be a, a guidance counselor, but it's uh, workers for us who are not in the classroom. So you can see that. The next uh, grid going down is the Chromebook. Uh, an iPad, and you can see the age and what type of machine. And then the last is the computer lab uh, equipment. So you can see, uh, such as in the top, um, the desktops, student desktops, we have 137 of them that are over, that are eight and over uh, years of age. On the right hand side, you can see the five year replacement plan that Mr. Segan developed um, specifically for that. Uh, notice in the top grid, uh, teacher desktops, we are moving from desktops to laptops because of that portability. And so there are no replacements for teacher desktops. They are all down in teacher laptops. Um, Bob, I don't know if you want to add anything else to this or just answer questions. Is that to you? Oh, just answer questions. Okay. Again, I think this is our first attempt at getting some visibility in what the Vernon Public Schools District has. So um, I think this is a uh, you know, good inventory. And we're certainly chewing up the inventory uh, over this next year. Uh, but we have a plan in place, and this is our approach. We'd certainly like to get it all at once, but uh, we know, um, you know, we got to break it down in little chunks and attack this a little bit at a time. All right. Anybody have any questions? This is our. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Segan, I wonder why you're recommending. I wonder why you're recommending. Um, putting money into student desktop? Not all classrooms need to have a laptop or a portability. Um, business classes, um, for instance, it's desktop, it stays in one place, um, it's wired directly, 
you, you don't need to move that amount of blood. Do we have any supportability issues with the, the machines that are in the uh, you know, six or seven, eight years? We have plenty of support issues <laughs> with those machines. Um, anything six, eight years old, um, we're basically stealing parts from older machines just to keep them running. Um, you know, application support, any new applications, very tough to get on these older machines. Um, they are most likely not supported if you're putting a new application on these machines. Yeah, I was really thinking like an operating system. I mean, I kind of imagine they're running older operating systems and not supporting these. Correct. Software. We probably have about 300 machines running XP currently. So. And XP is not supported. Correct. Any other questions, Mr. Kemp? Okay. Regarding the Chromebooks, there was a conversation a year or so ago about who might be the owners of the Chromebooks. And uh, I thought the idea was to put, it, put the Chromebooks in the possession of ownership in the, in the students' hands. Is that still a case or are we facing in some phase of that? I think for the most part the Chromebooks are in students' hands. Yes. They're, I'm sorry, they're what? They are in students' hands. Um, not a one-to-one -one initiative, but they're being used for whether it's SBAC testing or some other initiative uh, going on at the schools. Okay. Um, if the students are owning the Chromebooks then? They are not owning the Chromebooks. Oh, I didn't understand you correctly. There, there is not a one-to-one -one initiative currently. So meaning it's not a one-per-one -one device per student. Okay. So right. they are spread out throughout the district. Again, there's only 500 Chromebooks and you got a couple thousand plus students. So we're well short of having a one-to-one -one initiative with a, uh, that, that ratio. Is there a plan to uh, put Chromebooks in the hands of freshmen or, or as opposed to other grades or is there a plan? I refer or, that to uh, Dr. Conway. Well, is there a plan to have the students in fact own the computer, the Chromebooks or no. not? Again, I defer that to Dr. Conway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you miss the um, I know Mr. Uh, Rocket is very much in favor of a one-to-one -one, um, technology program. Uh, we've discussed over the past few years a bring-your-own device, and then we would provide devices students could sign out if they don't have a device of their own. Uh, we've also discussed the merits of one device, such as a Chromebook, uh, so that all the students would have the same exact platform and, uh, and we would be able to support them in a different way. Uh, we're at the very beginning of investigating that. My concern right now is uh, still in improving the rigor of instruction or the rigor of, of learning uh, and learning tasks at the high school. So we know we have a responsibility to ensure that our students have access to technology and are learning how to use technology in order to learn and to work because that's the real world. Um, but, um, but that hasn't come to the technology committee nor before the board and that would certainly be a board decision because it, it would be an investment uh, in, in the Chromebooks. Chromebooks used to have a life of three years. I've heard that we're now pushing it out to four and five years. So it is possible to give freshmen a Chromebook uh, freshman year and expect it to last the four years. Um, and have them buy it out at the end of those four years. That's just one idea. Uh, we don't know, you know where exactly uh, we're gonna recommend yet. And so the technology committee will be speaking of that. Mr. Rocket is uh, very um, passionate about, uh, about a one-to-one -one program. So I'm sure that the technology committee will be hearing about that before the year is out. Well, I don't need to know the final decision tonight, and none of us do really. I kind of I was going to ask some follow-on questions because I thought we were going to put them in the hands of students and they would be owning them. I reflect on some conversations that that indicated that the kids take much better care of them when they in fact own them or think they do, but in fact when they're given to them, they will do a better job of of taking care of them. Anyway. So, since that's not the case, I'd just like to have the Technology Committee discuss that option and uh, let us know what their decisions are about uh, ownership and uh, uh, how uh, that might be uh, evolving if they make that decision. Mr. Okay. 
So the one thing that I did want to make clear, because there was a lot of discussion on this, and I have my own personal opinion about it. First of all, we haven't had a five-year plan, so it's excellent that we have a five-year plan. And this isn't a criticism of a five-year plan because you were operating under the guidelines you were operating under. I do want everyone to understand, though, that we will continue to have eight-plus-year-old equipment in the environment for the next three to four years based on this five-year replacement plan. Because by the time you filter down through those columns every year, everything ages a year, and it's going to take that long to get rid of it. So I know that there are discussions about you know, the usability in a classroom, and I don't pretend to be an expert about it. I just want everybody to understand that we may hear the refrain from, from parents or teachers for years to come that they've got ancient computers in their classroom, and it's going to be true. So. Can you help me understand why there's no, in your five-year plan, it is the fifth year that you're proposing Chromebooks, purchase, purchase of Chromebooks, and it's not until... If you're looking at the Chromebook plan, yes, it'd be in the fifth year because we just currently purchased, you know, 500 Chromebooks this last year. So it's going to take until that cycle to be replaced. Um, according to the graph, mm -hmm. we have Chromebooks that are anywhere from zero to three years old. Um, zero to one year old for the VPS Chromebooks. If you look at the second item um, page on the left. I'm sorry. I was looking at the I was looking at the pie chart then. Oh, okay. 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 So is that how we we don't make a purchase for five years, and that's how we we're not getting we're not getting anywhere then. Yeah, I'm not saying we're not going to make a purchase in five years. This plan was to look at our current equipment and what do we do to replace it. So this is not the additional equipment we're going to be purchasing over the next five years. Um, which will certainly will be introducing new technologies, new equipment as the years go on. Um, but this is what we currently have in place and how we're going to move forward with our current equipment. So it doesn't account for other purchases? This is it does not. Okay. Any other questions? Question. Um, just, to, just to comment that as new technology comes in, possibly Chromebooks might not be what we would want to replace that with. This is just a plan in place for what is what we have now technology-wise and where we see us going in five years. It's, it's not that we're going to definitely purchase Chromebooks in five years. We're just going to, that, that will be replaced with whatever is the <coughs> state of the art out there at that point in time. So this plan is there was a change in it, and there this is, has to be a fluid plan as well because of technology not just sitting still. It's always changing. But this is what it looks like as of right now. Based on what Mrs. Bush said, um, is there a plan to replace them with different equipment? Um, I wish I could tell you what the future holds, <laughs> but um, yeah, three years from now, who knows what we'll be uh, replacing it with. It could be uh, Surface Pros, um, so we have to, we can anticipate it right now. Again, this is what we have now, so um, it gave us some visibility into what we do have, so we'll have to see what the future holds. And based on what you said about, did, did you say you ordered 500? We already currently own them, yes. Yes. These are the newer ones. Yes. But you still have the eight-year? We still have eight-year-old equipment in desktops and laptops, right. yes. Right, okay. So you think that would be efficient enough for the thousand plus students? Well, the plan is to replace them. So again, With, as it was stated, you know, we will have some equipment that's six years old next year. And the year after that, we'll have some equipment that's five years old, but we'll eventually catch up and have a plan in place. But when you replace it, I'm not clear. What are you replacing them with? 
Well, that's a good question. Um, currently, we're going to replace them with desktops or laptops, whatever the current model is. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? This, this plan um, just gives us a, a way to budget each year, too, for, mm -hmm. for this. I mean, I don't, it's, it's quite a bit of money, two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars in certain years, but um, at least gives us an idea of where to go when we are doing our budget process. So, anything else? Anything? Thank you so much. Yes. Um, the mayor has uh, allowed us to present. The town council had asked for a five-year plan, and so um, he has asked that we wait until their first meeting in January, which will be January sixth. So I've asked the technology committee if anyone's available, if they would like to come, and uh, Mr. Segan and I will be there on the sixth as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Segan, very much for all the work. This is a step in the right direction. Okay. We will move on to item 5.2, Alliance District Grant Positions, Sustainability, Dr. Conway. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. We have, uh, these happen to be all the Alliance District positions, and so obviously the lowest in priority are the 17-18 uh, budget at that point. So we've included them all. Um, our highest, uh, obviously the very first uh, priority is to finish funding all day kindergarten through the local budget, and so that's why I left that in a separate section up at the top. The board had already made that a priority. These are the last two and a half teachers to go in um, to the budget, so uh, and that's what those teachers actually are budgeted for through the grant. So uh, that would be $167,000. That actually is in the, the version of the budget that exists today, uh, one of the earliest versions. Um, so for, for the board's estimate of expenditures for 2015-16, or FY16, can see that the first thing that we truly felt was important was to ensure that our students come to the table ready to learn and so uh, all of those pieces this is one of the first things we purchased with the Alliance grant the pieces of the psychologist and the social workers and the truancy residency person making sure the kids are in school um, those were very very key uh, key positions and so that is a um, that's a top priority uh, because if, obviously if we can't get them to the table and make sure they're ready to learn when they're here, then uh, we can't get them to learn. Um, the other priority is um, the academic coaches. There are three. And uh, we would put one in year one and two others in year two um, to move those to the, uh, to the normal budget, to the local budget as well. Our second priority uh, for year FY17 uh, is really academics. And so we have two mathematics interventionists right now, one at the high school and one that is going back and forth between Skinner and, excuse me, between Northeast and Maple. And uh, we also have a reading interventionist at Northeast School. And so those three uh, items would be very, very key. They're funded 100%. Uh, these are, mathematics intervention has been something people have been screaming for since I've been here, so I'm sure it's been before that. And so we felt, felt that that was a secondary priority. And adding to that would be the uh, two other academic coaches to make sure um, that our academics, that our climate was up to speed, that our teachers are learning uh, new strategies and are implementing the curriculum. Uh, also in that year, which I did not put down because these were all positions, was our new, our new testing, um, NWEA MAP the um, measure of academic progress, and uh, that would be about $36,000 that year. We, of course, still do have two years of the grant. Uh, I'm assuming, I do not know, but I'm assuming we're going to be flat funded. So it'll be just over $2 million that we will receive in uh, FY16 and FY17 in each of those years. I do not know, again, um, that's my assumption. I have not heard that they're going to add to it, um, but I have also not heard that they're going to subtract from it as well. Uh, FY18 is the last year of the budget. You can see operations and those words in the left hand column, those are the state's words. They have four buckets. Um, the buckets are climate, academics, talent, and operations. And so that's why we use those words because that's how we had to categorize. 
If you recall, the board uh, asked us to provide common planning time for all of our teachers. And so just over a year ago, we included uh, pieces of our specialized, our special teachers, art and music, so that we could uh, make sure that all of our uh, elementary staff had common planning time. Our middle school staff does have common planning time with the uh, team time that they use. And our high school, that's, uh, the high school is trying to work on that and provide some common planning time, but it certainly is not cohesive. So we've got those, uh, art and music, and then the two reading recovery, actually 2.5 reading recovery teachers. Um, those positions, those are very, very expensive positions. Um, however, the results are absolutely phenomenal. So those teachers generally work with a small group of students over the course of an entire year. In most cases, they are able to um, graduate, more or less, a couple of kids at some point during the year and take on a few other kids. But I would say 10 is probably the maximum that these teachers work with over the course of an entire year. It changes their lives. Uh, these students are, they're first graders, all of them. They then read on grade level and our data shows that they have not slid back. So um, we have gone from marginal readers struggling to students who are reading on grade level and are able to keep up with their studies. So it is a, a phenomenal program. It costs an entire teacher. It costs over $7,000 for the original training and then extra training every single summer. So um, as I said, it's a very expensive program, but it does um, pay off beautifully. So we did put it on the, uh, on the list, but in year three, so that that could be a conversation for that time. Let's look at more data and see if that's something the board wishes to, uh, to put in the regular budget. And then um, finally, we have uh, the assistant principal at Center Road School and the behavior coach. Um, the assistant principal at Center Road School, of course, allows uh, the principal to get into classrooms. Our evaluation has changed. So that will also be a discussion in three years. We don't want to give that up at this point. But um, it will be very difficult for the principal to conduct evaluations, go into classrooms, go into grade level meetings, etc., cetera, uh, unless there's somebody else there to assist in that building. But that's a conversation, as I said, for really two, two years from now. Um, that because who knows what will happen with our population, with um, all kinds of things. So we certainly didn't want to commit. So FY16 and FY17 are um, two areas that we feel very strongly about. We um, are going to, right now, in the draft of the budget, we do have those for FY16. We do have those in the budget. Um, I think Mr. Picaro almost um, had apoplexy when I put those, <laughs> put those in. But they are right now in the first draft um, of the budget. And uh, so and if you have any questions, um, Mr. Burt knows these positions as well as I do. So does um, Mrs. Buell. And uh, any questions, I'm sure Mr. Picaro can answer. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Anybody have any questions? Mrs. Well, I think Mr. Picaro isn't the only one who's going to suffer with that reflexity. I think um, the issue I had way back when you were allocating Alliance money was this exact thing that you've made commitments to personnel rather than um, durable goods and that two hundred nineteen thousand dollars on top of the all-day kindergarten really gives me a lot of trouble um, now we're facing we're facing what the board um, actively discussed where where to put that money and making commitment to people i think in my opinion at that time and still is not the way we should have spent the money because now we're, we have to do exactly what we find distasteful, either funding that dollar amount or eliminating those positions. Mr. Kemp. Michelle, I'm not sure what exactly what you're saying. I, I, do you feel that we, the board should be backing away from our commitment to all-day kindergarten or, or maybe just be clear of what you're trying to say. I don't understand it. I'm certainly not backing off of all-day kindergarten. I, I think the, the dollars that we put into support staff and teachers and all, alliance dollars, is now coming back to bite us, David. That, that um, 
I believed then and I still believe that we should have spent that money on more durable goods and less personnel because this is what happens. We're being asked to assume salaries that the Alliance money was paying for. I'm not talking about all day kindergarten. We made a, a commitment to that. But the $219,000 um, that was Alliance money that's now going to be shifted to the board budget is very troubling to me. Now, these are positions that we, during our budget process, could decide whether we keep them or not, correct? Absolutely. This is our, um, this is our wish list. And, uh, and certainly, we did without all of these positions, Mrs. Fisher, before uh, the Alliance grant. So um, I still feel very strong about all the kindergarten, and I was delighted the board put that in. But um, I think our, uh, our expectations are that the board is going to discuss this and make a decision, and, and not this evening, but throughout the budget process, and, and decide where to put our eggs. So at the end of fiscal year 17, that's our last year of the Alliance grant. Is that correct? That is correct. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, if I may add, um, I did approach the executive director of the Connecticut Association of Public School Superintendents um, with my question. Um, we are one of the smaller districts who are receiving Alliance District funding. And uh, I said to him that we are in the process of looking at sustainability for some of these positions that we feel are, um, are, are hitting the mark. And I asked if he knew what was going to happen or if he could find out what was going to happen uh, in terms of two years from now. Is, uh, are we all going to fall off the funding cliff? And we get just over $2 million. I can assure you Meriden gets many, many times that. Uh, and so do other districts. So uh, Meriden, for instance, has uh, from year one uh, purchased uh, seven assistant principals for their elementary schools. Um, at this point, there is no plan in place to move those to uh, the local budget. And so that's my question is, are, are we the only ones who are concerned about this? Um, does someone else have information we don't? And so my understanding from my question to uh, Dr. Sersolo was that he does not believe anyone has any other information. And I said, okay, so um, he is going to try through his channels to get some sort of feedback. Um, this was the governor's um, plan along with the commissioner. And this governor will be here when we all fall off the funding cliff. So I'm hoping to have more information as time goes on. I don't know what would happen, but you recall, our ECS has not gone up in these three years in, in the town, whereas other towns has, have gone up, I think, a 2% two, two or so, I can't remember, is it two each year? I mean, they, they've actually received more in ECS, Vernon has not, nor has Meriden, Waterbury, Hartford, et cetera, um, in ECS. And, and so certainly, I know the town would expect at the end of the five years to receive whatever percent they didn't get over these five years, um, and I would too. Uh, that, uh, so, so we're not sure what's going to happen. We're trying to be thoughtful and, uh, and deliberative and, uh, and responsible, but um, we're also, I'm crossing my fingers and very hopeful that we'll get some indication of what the government plans to do in three years. So my, my real concern is that before we've even started talking about the 2015-2016 budget, tonight alone we've added $600,000 to it. And that's just in two items <laughs> between the technology and this. Uh, given the, the climate lately and the budget talks, um, I'll, I will be very curious to see where that money is coming from or how we're arriving at that number. Thanks. This is our, would it be appropriate to consider um, when you're submitting your alliance funding expenditures to start backing away from personnel and, and to, to not put us in this position and to, to do more in other 
ways rather than people? Uh, through the chair. Uh, this year we did not purchase any people in year three. Uh, we did year one was almost 100% people. Uh, year two was probably 90% people. Uh, and we knew that was all, uh, that was as far as we could go. Um, there was no way we were even going to be able to support them. We, we know this is not a feasible list, but we did prioritize it and say it, it, this would be good for, uh, for Vernon, for our kids, uh, to, to do what we've asked to do, at least in the first two years. Um, but, where's I oh, but in year three, this is the year we purchased level readers, um, the uh, new assessment system, Aspen, or Aspen was last year, I think. Oh, Aspen was this year. There, so there are uh, lots and lots of things. We technology, wireless at the middle school, uh, all of those, the smart boards for all the elementary classrooms. So that's what we were doing this year, and that's the plan. The next two, we will certainly not add any, um, add any staff. Could we subtract it? Absolutely. We were hoping uh, to subtract some as we, um, you know, as we go along. Uh, the concerns are where we would subtract, unless we were moving them into the local budget, where we su would subtract, of course, would be at the, the least priority for us. And so if we can have some of these services, such as reading recovery, even though we're going to stop it in three years, why not do that uh, rather than just not do it? And so that would be my concern about taking those positions out at this point, unless they were going to the local budget by priority. Did you understand that last? Okay. Um, and, and a different way of thinking might be instead of investing um, sixty thousand dollars per teacher to impact ten students. Maybe the money—not that that's not a good thing—but maybe that money would be better spent where it impacts more students for a longer period of time. So, eliminating personnel off of this list before we have to, to me, makes more sense, and replacing it with durable goods, um, so that we can do less of this as time goes on. I, I would be hard pressed. I know it's your wish list, but I would be hard pressed to support that. I don't think our our budget, our our um, town will support that. So if you can do some damage control and reduce positions and replace it with long-lasting items, I think you would be doing everybody a favor. Um, now I know the benefit of a reading recovery program. And I understand that it only, only benefits a small amount of children, but bringing those, that small amount of children up will only help um, our, our, our scores and everything for the future. Um, is, the, is it a possibility to um, transfer those into like a Title I? I know reading recovery is something that is usually put in like a Title I situation. The, that part of the budget through the chair. The um, our Title One budget is is spent to the penny right now. Uh, we actually have mathematics interventionists and reading interventionists. And to Ms. Arnie's point, um, they service a lot a lot more children than the reading recovery does at a different level, certainly. Um, but I would say that if um, teachers were asking, they would prefer the interventionists. Um, they know what reading recovery does, and they, they know that, but they're looking to serve a wider number of students um, than, than what reading recovery can do. So I, I understand that, but that's, that's where our Title I dollars are going. Um, are these dollar, do these dollars amounts include benefits as well? Um, no, I just included the salaries, you're right. Uh, but most of these people have. Salary. No, they don't. They don't. The, part, the partial ones were already in our budget, but the, the whole ones are not. And some of these people were teachers here beforehand anyway, right. but um, judging from our enrollment, we're going to have to lose some teachers if we were to come back in the classroom. Yes, just just um, for clarification, did the budgets prior to Alliance money support coaches? Academic, were there any prior to academic? 
Uh, we, we had five academic coaches prior to the Alliance District, but they were all funded with Education Jobs Fund, which was in uh, President Obama's first term. He gave us funding starting in September and lasting for 19 months or so. And then this one, this uh, grant came out right after that. And so we were able to move the funding from one to the other. So in our local budget, the answer is no, they were not in our local budget. They were here before Alliance, however, just funded by a different grant, a short-term grant. So we would have had the benefit of academic coaches for how many years? When um, the Alliance was over? Five years? Oh, five during Alliance and just over one, or just under one, actually, with the other, by the time we hired them and trained them and all of that. So okay. it'll be six altogether. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. This will be a rich conversation during the budget time. So we'll move on to item 5.3, class sizes and enrollment at UCMS and Rockville High. Thank you very much, Mrs. Fisher. Um, at the last meeting, we presented you with uh, charts that look very similar to this. A couple of questions were asked about courses that were combined, such as German 2 and German 3. So um, we have removed those. Uh, may have reordered uh, them as well. So on page one, uh, up at the top, just for your information, CCE is College and Career Exploratory. Okay. And, uh, and you'll see that throughout. So those are generally quarter credit or half credit uh, courses um, that run, just to let you know. And those are brand new this year. Um, let's see. Numbered. I apologize for the blank sheet that was in, in mine. There was a blank sheet. I don't know if it wasn't yours, the third one in. Um, if you move to category two, which is uh, on the fourth page, these are programs or courses that are restricted in size. So, um, so baking can only have 10 to 15 uh, students in a class. You're not supposed to have uh, more than that. Uh, there's another CCE, College and Career uh, Exploratory, and ho that's hospitality. You can see those going down. Each department tried to put those in. But these are uh, courses, so we took those out of the others, which uh, by the board's, uh, the board's policy, you have uh, 15 to 25 at the secondary level is your class size. So this is uh, slightly smaller. The next page, category three, are AP or ECE, um, Early College Experience courses. Uh, all of these for ECE are the UConn credit courses, and so students uh, experiencing those will receive college credit at UConn. The AP courses, the students need to take an AP exam and score three or higher, three, four, or five, in order to receive college credit um, that they have to then apply to the college to get that credit. So these courses are uh, generally offered to juniors and seniors, and they're sometimes a little bit smaller. Uh, there's category four, our independent studies. Uh, those are not teaching sections. Those students do work with teachers and meet with them, but uh, as we don't assign a teacher to those sections. Category five is the one that uh, Mr. Hull asked about last time, what ones are combined. So this page is set up a little bit differently, but you can see that the physics, early college experience, and honors uh, courses are uh, meet at the same time. So under the total enrollment column, the 13 of one with the two of the other meet at the same time, and the 19 and the three meet at the same time. Uh, German, one, college and honors, you can see that those 15 students meet at the same time. German two and three, college and honors, all of those students meet at the same time, there were nine of them, et cetera, uh, going right down. So each shaded group meets together. Uh, about the sixth one from the bottom, Java Fundamentals and Office Apps, you can see that you've got one and 13 meeting together and two and 17 meeting together. So um, the end is obviously a larger, a larger section, but that was, that was the one that was most um, requested last time was can you remove those from the others so the ones at the beginning of the packet are all singletons um, they do not meet with uh, two different courses and category six was um, remedial or skills-based classes um, possibly for um, individuals with disabilities as well sure. seven. Seven. Category seven. 
Well, I missed the category seven. Right. I apologize. Oh. Grad point. Um, at grad point, these, these uh, courses, thank you, are taken by students either in a study hall or a free period or after school or at home. Um, they all do meet with um, Mr. Mm, that's awful. Dickinson. Dickinson, absolutely, thank you. Um, with Mr. Dickinson, and Mr. Dickinson also works with the other teachers uh, in the school, so he is in classrooms uh, as well. Um, but these are all students taking, uh, it's, they're like independent studies, but they touch base with, uh, with Mr. Dickinson as well. Thank you, Mr. Campbell, sorry. So that was the information that was requested, and any questions? Any questions or comments? Yeah. Yes, I still don't understand it all, and it will take some time to really figure this out. I, I suppose it, it really comes down to trying to understand numbers like three and four and six and two, and why they would, and if they are in a standalone class with a full time teacher or not. And just looking at this doesn't really, um, at first glance, tell me the answer to that. So what I'm asking you is to help us understand a little better, maybe we have to look at this again in, in another evening, where um, in category two you might have combined classes and haven't. Um, I'm just going to pick one. Uh, Hospitality Q1, there's a three and an eight. That's correct. One class has three students and one class has eight students. Well, so yeah, but what I mean is, are, are they active, are they meeting at the same time no. with the same teacher? No. The only ones that meet at the same time is um, the shade of five, 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 that page. Well, right. Why, for heaven's sakes, are three and eight not combined? I, I just don't understand that. Um, and there are other examples here, but th that's the kind of thing that raises the question, exactly. not only of a, a board member, but <clears throat> a town councilor and a mayor. They would like to know why there are three kids in a classroom uh, at all. Well, we agree with you, Mr. Kemp. That's why we're presenting you with this information. Um, actually, today, Mr. Burt and um, Mrs. Buell and I met individually with Mr. Harrison and Mr. Rocket to see how we can um, be both fiscally responsible and educationally sound in our offerings here. Well, besides combining them necessarily, if you only have um, a, a few number of, of, of students, uh, let's say I'll pick on woodworking too, and I have no agenda here for any one course, okay? I'm just trying to grab something that jumps out at me. Item four. The, I guess the next question is then why offer it at all? Okay. Now, I know you can't split a teacher right down the middle and so on. What did you already have? And you don't, you're kind of a slave to who signs up for what. I get that part. But nevertheless, there's so much of this three and four and two that it just cannot continue. Uh, there may be an aberration here, a scheduling problem there, but this is, this transcends the entire uh, document and we can't afford that. We're, we're trying to justify other other staff positions and, and you know to us this look this looks like an obvious answer. You know if I had to vote on this right now I would just there's your answer. That's how you're going to have your alliance people and anything else we need and the computers and so on because this just can't go on. I think one of the things that you missed at the last session, Mr. Kemp, was the comments from Dr. Conway that she's going to be bringing some proposals for her during, during uh, budget season, which are going to have staffing impacts. And, and at that time, this information is, is for us to understand why we're seeing those staffing impacts. Uh, I didn't hear her say that tonight, but you missed that at the last meeting, so I just want to make sure you were aware of that. Well, thank you. Well, I would hope that it would be more than staffing impact. As it, the idea isn't, nece it isn't necessarily to uh, eliminate someone's position, but it should also be program impact or course impact, okay, whether or not we should be offering something. 
So we might be able to retain a person and use them more effectively elsewhere if we are rethinking what we're offering and why. Okay. Is that anticipated discussion going to take place during budget? Yes. Not prior to they, they during will be, uh, Actually, our next meeting is the budget presentation. Um, so the board's next meeting. So that's why we brought these to you at the last meeting and this meeting. Um, the first version was in our la your last packet. Um, Mr. Hull had asked us to pull out those smaller, the courses that are combined. So that was, um, that was a great idea. And, um, and that's why we brought this to you to, to present the enrollment numbers to you during budget season. Certainly it will be in your backup information. But you need to have a full knowledge of, of what we're seeing and the concerns that Mr. Burt, Mrs. Buell, and I have had in looking at these numbers since the beginning of September, um, knowing we could never present a budget to the board that contained classes with this size. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really, I wanted the board to see this, I wanted the board to digest it um, and be ready for some questions. Uh, the presentation will be the 12th, and Mr. Harrison and Mr. Rocket will be here on the 14th um, for that budget, so it'll, they'll be together, actually. So these kinds of numbers only exist in this only exist this year. Oh no, I'm sure I'm sure they didn't. I'm sure they didn't. We didn't have access to that. I don't know if Mr. Burke doesn't have anything with him, but um, we printed out of the old uh, computer system, the old student software system, and the, the document's probably 55, 60 pages long. Um, it makes no sense. You can't organize it. You can't do anything with it, and so it was all smoke and mirrors. And that's why, as soon as Mr. Burt was able to get into the system when we were up and running at the beginning of September, he ran these numbers and he came into me and he said, you've got to see this. Yeah. And so we've been working on it since then. But this is, we have not, we have reduced some staff. I would say in the past eight years, I probably at the high school reduced by oh, 12 or 15 positions. But with our population decreasing, um, we have not decreased at the same rate uh, as uh, the staff has not decreased at the same rate. And so we've got uh, one thing that we kept looking at was our, our Algebra 1. And I'll, I'll just be very frank. You look at Algebra 1, which is the top of the second page. Our average class size is 13.6. So tell me why we have a failure rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, of, of anything. No, you tell me. Yeah, well, that, exactly. That's... <laughs> And I would love to be able to tell you that. Um, so that's that's extremely concerning. And it, it, with all of those um, classes that are smaller, it, with almost one to one, it should it, we shouldn't do that. I'm sorry, we're having a conversation here. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize for that. So these numbers are a surprise to you. Uh, they were at the beginning. I knew that they they were there were smaller classes, but I had no idea that so they were like this. So who did know? Pardon? Who did know? I would imagine the high school principal prior to Mr. Rocket, who was, um, you know, living there, and you see the classes and you just go. They just stay in the radar. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Just a question in category two. There's a listing for the uh, job of fundamentals S one with uh, one class and eleven people, but then that also appears as we discussed under category five, Java fundamentals as part of the office application. So is that a mistake or no. they? No, it's not. There are two sections. Three. Three sections. Three. Oh, right, three sections. So the students who are on uh, category five probably could not fit it into their classes. Um, the, the regular course of Java fundamentals, um, which has 11 students, and they really wanted to take it. So I'm guessing they're juniors and seniors, one and two of the three students. And so they are in a freshman office applications class taking that. So they probably um, you know, converse with the teacher while students are working and, uh, and do a lot of it independently. But they're getting the same assignment as the uh, teacher is giving the other, the full class. And they really wanted to take it. Thank you. My second question is, does the high school still allow students uh, to potentially audit classes if they can't fit it into their schedule. Um, it happens sometimes where 
you know, if they're in the VOAC program, for instance, they can't attend all that five-day class, but maybe they can do three days out of the five or, or things like that. I don't think that happens anymore with block scheduling. Okay. I think that used to happen when you had a lab course that interrupted, but right. now all courses are two blocks. Okay, long. thank you. I just wanted to ask about the independent study. Could you clarify what the uh, staff coverage is for independent study? That, that would be, um, staff does not get paid extra for that. So if you are a senior and you're very interested in, oh, where's that? Independent studies. Four, four, Um, so office applications, it could be someone, or video production is, is easy, I know, I'm pretty sure I know who that student is, um, who is just fascinated with video production, wants to learn more, and, and uh, is doing that on his own, probably after school, and in the evening, and uh, meeting with the teacher on the fly, maybe once a week. Um, so it's, it, these are students who really want creative writing, would be the same. Um, the education, the office apps, we offer that class, so I'm not sure exactly, I don't know which student that is, but it could be someone who's, it's a requirement for graduation, so it could be a student who's come in as a, a junior and just needs that credit and is taking it that way. But um, they meet with student, we, they meet with teachers as needed. They could meet with them every day, but then they'd probably be scheduled into the class, so I'm guessing it's mostly they meet with them as needed, because it's, it's independent study. All right, so there's no way then that that constitutes a a, a period. The That's teacher. correct. That is correct. It is not. All right. Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much. We'll discuss this again, I'm sure, during such a time. Okay, we'll move on to item five point four, finance committee report. 5.4A, year to date report. Good evening to you, Madam Chair, to the board. I call your attention to Exhibit A, the year to date budget report. Uh, overall, uh, we discussed this briefly in Finance Committee meeting prior to tonight's board meeting. Uh, very little change from the last meeting. Uh, overall, we, are, uh, we have expended $17.6 million of our $51.3 million appropriated budget. An additional 27.3 million in encumbrances, leaving us with six, approximately 6.4 million. That reflects an 87.6 percent utilization rate. Um, we are still showing negatives from the last uh, report in our salary and non-affiliated account, social worker account, temporary salaries account. But we're working internally to reconcile those salary accounts, and you will see them uh, reconciled with budget transfers and or amendments for next finance committee. There are no other questions on that. I'd be glad to move on to the focus of our discussion, which is our draft feasibility study. So, anybody have any questions on the year to date budget? Yes, I, I just wanted to uh, try and stay with you, Michael. Um, yes, sir. The, the special ed accounts in total, uh, there's, there's plus, there's minus, but overall, what is your impression of, as to how we stand in, in those accounts, please? Sure. Uh, through the chair, and we discussed this briefly at the last finance committee meeting. Uh, we have received our preliminary revenue uh, estimates from the State Department of Education, and uh, at this point in time, we are in black, a couple of issues, and it uh, looks like we could be in the ballpark uh, about uh, $200,000 at this point, but again, very early in the year, so we'll have to see you know, how things play out over the next few months. Our, as you know, uh, timing wise, our next uh, Estimates will be coming from State Department of Education in April, where we'll have a more precise uh, estimate of where we are. How is the new software, relatively new software the program that we're using, helping us with Medicare uh, recovery? The chair, um, I believe, referring to um, our work with our vendor copy claim and recouping and maximizing our reimbursement expenses, uh, reimbursable expenses um, mm -hmm. for that. Okay. Um, very well. Uh, we are expecting an increase of about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 over what we had brought in in revenue for the prior year. So it continues to go up. And uh, I think Mrs. Buell and her staff are finding some creative ways to uh, track more in more detail for example, uh, special education transportation is a big area 
that's untapped at this point, and we are collecting that data in hopes of putting it in for reimbursement as well. So uh, I think we're doing everything we can to collect as much data that we could use for reimbursement purposes that we can, and the vendor's been a big part of that, and there's been a lot of training and so forth to, uh, to get us there. Just to clarify, if we're tracking for twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars increase, what is the cost of the vendor? So, are we actually getting twenty-five or thirty thousand? Are we paying some of that uh, through the chair? Yes, uh, we do pay on a sliding scale. So, the the incentive, which is one of the reasons why we went to this vendor versus our vendor from prior years, uh, was the more money we bring in, the more they they uh, they charge. And so the maximum at this point is uh, 9%. Uh, and so obviously they're trying to get the 9%, which helps us get the most out of our money. And that, so that 25,000 uh, includes uh, their fee being removed from that. Any other questions on the year to date budget? Okay, we'll move on to uh, 4B. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Before you in Exhibit B, uh, is a draft feasibility study as directed by the Board of Education on uh, a prior meeting. Uh, uh, you will see from the, uh, the way that the RFP is structured, this is a major undertaking. Uh, it is a, a draft study to determine the future structure of our school system. Specifically, uh, it seeks an analysis and appraisal of several educational components specifically student enrollment, educational programs, grade organization, or reorganization, school facilities, and building capacities. Uh, and so uh, by way of a quick overview, as we discussed in the Finance Committee meeting, when we were putting this together, uh, we did look at many other school districts that uh, took on similar scopes of work. And overall, uh, many of the school districts took slices of it. Uh, and very few are doing what we're doing, uh, which is not a bad thing. It's actually, I think, a very comprehensive way of looking at our entire education system. But this is a major undertaking that looks at a very wide spectrum of educational components uh, and will be providing us with recommendations in each of those categories uh, for, for change. Uh, overall, uh, the Finance Committee prior to this meeting uh, discussed the dates uh, for when this would be rolled out, and so I'd like to quickly review those with you and then talk specifically about the components and general requirements uh, discussion that we had, which is at the end of the RFP. Uh, by way, of, again, of overview, the pre-bid conference for this RFP, assuming that we could put this RFP out uh, this week, would be on January 7th. That would be a mandatory pre-bid conference. We felt that uh, due to the comprehensive nature of this request for proposals and the, the technical specificity uh, of it, we need to have that pre-bid conference with any potential vendors and make it a mandatory requirement. The second major milestone date in this process would be on January 21st. That's the uh, deadline for any questions in writing submitted to the business office uh, related to this proposal. Answers to those questions by way of our normal uh, bid process would be posted very transparently online for all vendors to, uh, to see and for the public to see as well. Uh, the due date uh, would be uh, February 11th and uh, the award we anticipate uh, through an evaluation process with the scoring rubric in place by that date would be three weeks, three to four weeks from that date. So uh, if everything were to go as planned and we were to uh, release this RFP in the next week, uh, we could see an award sometime in the uh, beginning of March or second week by the second week of March. The other major milestone dates is currently written in draft form uh, would be based on the payment schedule and you'll see that in the payment section of this draft RFP. The first would be uh, the data collection phase. Once the vendor collects all of the necessary data, the initial payment would be made. There is no date tied to that. However, uh, May 6th would be the second major milestone, which would be when the draft report would be due, and then the final product, the final report and presentation to the board uh, is currently written in as June 3rd. And if, then if I can call your attention to section four, components and general requirements, we specifically included this section in the RFP uh, to, to really zero in on what the board was looking for and looking to get out of this uh, request for proposal. And again, uh, I believe we captured the majority of it uh, in here, uh, specifically in 4.2 through the questions A through F there. 
Um, but this is really a section where if board members have uh, specific needs, concerns that they'd like to see addressed in this request for proposal, that we can certainly write them in. Uh, the bulk of the rest of the proposal uh, is our standard, our new standard RFP template that we're using. Uh, so this is really the area of the, of the request for proposal that we can customize uh, further. And uh, at that point, I'd be glad to take any questions or have further discussion. Mr. Stanson. Through you, Madam Chair. Mr. Picaro, I appreciate the aggressive dates, but are, I'm a little concerned about how aggressive they are. If you're saying we're not going to make the award until potentially the first week of March, then you're giving them essentially, you know, eight weeks to do the data gathering and have a preliminary report. Are we sure that's enough time given the, the level of detail that we're, that we're asking for? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, again, draft. We could certainly expand it if, uh, the, if that's the board's wish. Uh, I came up with that time frame uh, by looking at some of the other proposals that were out there and basing on some of those time frames. So we, just didn't, you know, we, we did put some science to it, but you know, again, this is meant for discussion and it's a starting point for us and we can customize it further if the board wishes. Can I just ask, is that something when you have your pre-conference that you can talk to the bidders and see if that time frame is feasible for them? Is that something you could cover yes. at that meeting? And we do, uh, if, if folks are concerned about uh, changing that, we do, as written in the, the current uh, draft RFP under our reserve rights sections, we do have the ability to uh, to make some of those changes if, if we feel that's in the best interest of the board. Mr. Kevin. Mr. Kevin. Michael, I, I think that most of the document here is technically very correct uh, going on from item two through four. You know, I, I mean, you've included everything you, we could hope to have you include as far as process goes. But my concern is um, the the uh, scope of the project, and I don't think it, it uh, in, in item 1.2 and also in your summary, item 4.2, you address several aspects of, I think, what the board was wanting to be um, considered, like reconfiguration and redistricting and, and uh, population projections that the state or Dr. Prouda uh, might provide for us. But there's so much more to this. I mean, the, the future of our school system and where it might land sooner than later transcend so many other things that I, I just don't see uh, a company in a, in a pre-qualification meeting um, being able to get their arms around it. Um, yes, we could have the pre-conference, but uh, it's not up to them to say, they'll say they can do it. You know, you could do that tomorrow, they'd say they could do it. Um, but, I'll give you a few examples. We have um, to understand what kind of uh, housing units the town is going to be uh, putting in place and where, whether they're condos or they're apartments, and uh, not only in terms of sheer numbers, but uh, are they elderly housing units? Are they housing units that would hold children? Um, are they, uh, and where are they? Uh, are they uh, across the interstate? Are they this side of the interstate? Are they in Rockville? Or where are they? Uh, that's one example. The, uh, the whole impact of block scheduling, I don't really have a strong opinion one way or the other what configuring, configuration of block scheduling there may or may not be, but um, there is um, the potential of magnet school seats is really enormous. Uh, the mag <laughs> that magnet schools continue to construct newer seats, uh, even newer than they had originally intended in some of the buildings that they're building, where they had planned on 400 seats, now they're looking at 525. Collectively, there's 12 or 13 magnet schools, and they're all either opening or expanding their capacity. How is that going to be understood by this, this uh, potential vendor? I, I just don't know, but some of it is known, some of it is not. We need to understand that. The potential for legislation as it might impact Vernon Public Schools is significant. We don't really know what the state is going to 
pass uh, as far as legislation goes, and I'll give you an example. Early childhood, what are they going to expect us to do here? And what, if anything, might they do in open choice? Right now, that's a voluntary program. The state has guidelines to come up with 3% of the Hartford kids that they want to go to towns outside of Hartford. They don't expect it, they don't demand, uh, require it of individual towns. If the legislature, with this new uh, Chef O'Neill offshoot, I forgot the acronym, there's a new lawsuit that was going to go forward in January and they're not going that fast, but anyway, if, if the legislation imposes upon the town's requirements for open choice placements, that would impact Vernon significantly. And I don't know what that, that outcome might be. There are, um, there are tech ed placements currently at, at um, Cheney, at uh, uh, Wyndham Tech, and we were just understanding the other evening that we had many more than we realized, that they weren't being tracked by us and I guess the other institutions either. But in other words, what is our tech ed plan here? If, if the technical colleges are capable of taking, uh, excuse me, not colleges, well, maybe them too, but if the technical schools are capable of offering programs that we're attempting to offer here, the question is why are we doing it? when the kids might be better served at Cheney Tech or Wyndham Tech or wherever. I have no idea, but if we are going to look at the, the, this school system, what we offer and where, we need to understand that too. Um, uh, I might have missed something here. But the point is, this, this is much bigger than, than what some vendor might say yes to you know, in a week or two. And uh, I mean, I'd like to send this back to committee for much further consideration as to what we're asking a vendor to tell us. I mean, I, I just get several right here, but I, I don't think a vendor is going to be able to get their arms around that very quickly. And I don't want to pay somebody and then have them say, well, you never asked us that. Right? As far as bringing it back to committee, Mr. Kemp, I'm not sure how um, that would benefit us, benefit us right now. I think this is a request for proposals, right? This is, this is, this is information that they're going to provide to us based on the questions that we ask in this pre-bid um, pre me the meeting, the conference. Um, it is a very complex subject. And I don't think there's lots of vendors out there that can answer the questions. And I think we could write pages, but I think some of the discussion that is going to be held during the, the pre-grid conference is that information, those types of subject matter that you, you were just referencing, that understand, we, we don't know what we don't know. And there's a lot of things there that we won't know until legislation is actually passed that we can't predict, but we wouldn't want to try and position ourselves for what we do know now. And, um, you know, again, this is just a request for a proposal to see where we go next. Um, I don't think going back to committee would, would change that. Can I, can I piggyback on that? Too? I, just some, some of the things you brought up, David, to me, come under A, where it's just the student enrollment projections. Because that studying how many are going to go to bandit school, how many are going to go to tech ed placements will affect our enrollment. So to me, those things come under um, item A. Well, I don't know what the vendor's interpretation of enrollment projections might consist of. Well, that's what would be covered at the pre-conference um, that they would do in January. Well, I've already put it on my calendar. I hope you were expecting me to be there because I wouldn't miss this for the world. I mean, because in one short paragraph, you, you, you articulate what is a very brief uh, introduction to the, to the vendor. If I were the vendor, I would... I mean, this is it's only five lines, okay? I mean, it doesn't begin 
to address the scope of what I thought we were trying to um, get our arms around. I, I just don't see that happening in a pre-bid conference. I really don't. I, I appreciate all the points you're making, Mr. Kent, but I think if I if I go back to our original discussion and just keep it simple, stupid, we want to know if the buildings we have are being used efficiently. Do we have? Can we operate more efficiently? And and all of the information used to make that decision is going to be based on somebody's best guess, on based on data, but their best guess. And we had a lot of this done for us with that company a year ago who came in and, I don't remember the name, help me, Mr. Beccaro, who, who Futures. thank you, yes, who made recommendations about the things that we're doing and not doing and what we could be better at. So although I, I think all of your, you know, your points are valid, um, I'm, I'm going to politely <coughs> suggest that maybe you're overthinking it. All we really need to know is, are we efficient? Could we be more efficient? And, and how could we be more efficient? Um, I'll, you know, Dr. Prouty and his um, forecasting was pretty poor, was no help to us. Um, I hope that wouldn't be anything that we're considering. There's got to be other numbers out there, but our history is going to show that we've declined in population and there's nothing to make us think that we're going to grow in population. So, anyway, and then my, my other question is, we've already closed three buildings that I'm four buildings that I'm aware the Polylog School and the, the kindergarten building at the top of Center Road, um, Sykes, at Vernon Elementary and Sykes. And we survived it and we didn't do it with this scientific method. We said, look, we got more, more building than kids and we can't afford to do this and we're not going to do it anymore. So to me, it, although I understand there's a need to have data as much as we can, I, I get that and I think that's important, but we can't know everything, and to me, it will come down to some to a simple recommendation. Um, you're doing fine. Your your building use is efficient, or it's not. And recommendations to either use our buildings differently, or use one less building, or whatever. Um, but I would hate to tie the hands of a company by by too much overthinking. Um, if they get the gist of it, if they know what we're looking for, then I would hate to tie their hands so we don't get the information, or the, in the end, we don't get the recommendation that we're looking for. Um, this is um, well, as you mentioned, we had the futures uh, study that we did, and I don't know if we got everything out of it that we had wanted or hoped, what I don't want to happen, I kind of agree with Mr. Kemp in that way, that I want to make sure we're, we are getting what we really want instead of putting money into a study that we aren't getting all the information we want, that we have to set up another study for in the future. So I would, when I went through the timeline proposal, I'm a little concerned about its time because here we are. We need to focus on the budget. We need to focus on, you know, all those things. Maybe we need to just slow it down a little bit and kind of reset up where we're going before we jump into something and make sure it's not really what we want in the long run. Mr. Cole. I come back to the fact that this is a request for proposals from companies that help people do this type of activity. This is not a proposal of what we're going to do. We're not paying anybody for these proposals. This is for them to come in and say, these are the services we can provide to help you do the things that you want to investigate. This is how we approach it. This is the types of things you could get. This is our cost to do that. Once we have that information, then we make the decision, are we going to move forward with this proposal? Or are we not? And if we don't like any of the proposals that we get, we don't take any of them. We go back to the drawing board. You're, I think we're all overthinking this. This is a request for proposals, eight weeks to put something together to tell us what you could do. And you know, if you figure out eight weeks is like about 320 man hours per person, that's a lot of time to put together a proposal. Again, 
Just something to think about. I think we're overthinking this. Mr. Stanton. I, so I kind of agree that we're overthinking it. The one thing I would say, though, is I agree with Mr. Kemp that we should consider looking and spiking out specifically, you know, I, I think item A to give a little more detail. Um, if, if we included things that we're looking for in there instead of just, you know, make a guess on our enrollment, then we might be able to get a little more relevant data, like you know, updated student enrollment projections for the next ten years, um, including you know, magnet school, etc. Some way to to phrase item A to be a little more comprehensive and a little less, you know, you could come at it five different ways, and each one would technically be correct. I agree that ultimately we're going to make the decision on which one to go forward with, but I'd like to arm them with enough information about what we're actually looking for so that what they propose is relevant to what, what we want. Um, is this going to incorporate any or any part of the uh, BOAG operation? Uh, through the chair, yes, the entire system will be examined. Yes? Yes, sir. Um, also, at, at our finance committee meeting, we did discuss the possibility of including our athletic fields and facilities um, in this RFP. And um, after much discussion, I'll let Mr. Poole um, summarize it for you. I think what um, we came away with was that uh, we should also put out a separate RFI or, or the RFI we think we have to go for first um, for information on what to do with the field so that when it comes time to putting together a plan we have that but it doesn't distract us from the use of buildings because um, I think this is a, as Mr. Kemp alluded to there's a lot of different components to this to consider and I think it's different uh, different experts that would provide information on how to use sporting uh, fields and facilities uh, versus how to use your instructional facilities. So uh, I, I would make a recommendation that as a board, we uh, ask administration to bring back, and I put it in the form of a motion, if you'd like, just to, to make it official here, that we ask the administration to come back with a uh, separate RFI for sports uh, facilities uh, Feasibility. Here we go. I'll second that. Okay. Any more discussion, comments on that motion? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Yeah, motion carries. I just want to point out, according to the town's fiscal report, it's available public information. The, uh, the capacity of the buildings that we occupy are roughly 65% if we follow the state's formula. It's in the last page of the annual report. They use a very outdated formula, but it's what they use. And to each of our schools, if you read the town's published document, shows us at uh, a very low percent of occupancy. One other thing in our committee meeting, we did uh, item D under 4.2. We just changed the language a little bit on that. There are the estimated cost and cost savings associated with each recommendation. In other words, if they recommended reconfiguration, what would the cost be to do that? What would we save? I would move that we move forward with proceeding with the information, incorporating those items that we can that make sense to Mr. 
uh, Kent proposed uh, into the list of information that we're interested in finding. I think that's a, a rather uh, easy tweak to this and that we move forward with the dates proposed. Is there a second? Mr. Stansel? Any questions or comments? All, all those in favor? Anyone opposed? Motion carries. I'm sorry, that's Kent, Lintner, and Bush. Item 5.5, which is the um, proposed agenda change. Hi, yeah, Mrs. Fisher. I, I do apologize. Um, Mrs. Um, Buchanan and I now have a, a good system in place where um, she is typing the minutes and then I'm going through with all my copious notes. And uh, we did not start that until the first meeting in October. Um, so we, uh, so I did miss this, and we did notice it at arbitration the other evening. We had the motion to go into executive session, and we did not have the motion that you made uh, when you came out of executive session in terms of ratifying the contract or approving the contract pending ratification by the administrator's uh, union. So um, I would ask that you add this um, to the, uh, and it was also noted Mr. Stansel had left the meeting. Um, at that point. So it's on page seven of the minutes, and I would ask that you approve uh, that, and I promise you that our, our system has been working for two and a half months now, and so we will continue with that system. I apologize. I have a question. Uh, this was our meeting on September 22nd, and unfortunately, Mrs. Russell was not with us at that time. She actually was in attendance that evening. Okay, I wasn't sure what the date was that you went to. That was the meeting she was for. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry. for the number. Right. Is there a motion to revise the agenda, the uh, minutes of September 22nd? Mr. Stansel. I'd like to make a motion that the board approve the revised Board of Education meeting minutes dated September 22nd, 2014 to include the information and motion highlighted above. Is there a second? Mr. Kent, any questions, comments, concerns? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, um, move on to item 6.0 to review and update the Board of Education calendar. Does anybody have anything on the calendar that they would like to address? Well, 6.7, opportunity for questions from the press on agenda items. It's done. Last motion. Mr. Bull. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Mr. Stanton. All those in favor? Yes. Thank you. Have a very happy holiday, everyone. Thank you.